My Gavanan Melunin and well met indeed. I am Arakia Gala Jerathan, apologies moving the microphone, and I am the head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer. And welcome back to Divide and Conquer as we continue on with the faction overviews. And as promised, this time it is Canned. Canned, of course, did not have a faction overview for version 0.52, which is why people even now continue to berate me with requests. Please, Galu, do Canned, do Canned, please. I'd love to know more about them. Well, now you can. As here, we have Cand. Or more accurately, the Variags of Cand, the chief clan in the lands of Cand. Can I say Cand more in the intro? Yes, I can. Cand, Cand, Cand. Right, so size of your domain and the initial starting army. Well, Cand's actually not too bad. Uh, you got, as you can see from the little images down below, there are about five regions that you start with. You've got Oibamari marking your northern border, Amu Khand in the centre, Kizilkum off centre on the west, Strelutza Khand down on the southern edge, which also happens to be your capital, and Chelkar out pushing you close to the lands of Horondor, southern Gondor, and up, of course, to Gondor itself. The armies that you actually start with are res re reasonably, that's not a word, reasonably large. Uh, there's a little garrison there at the edge, as you can see, bordering um, Horondor. The garrisons in the cities aren't as large, but um, you've got enough that you could pull together a sizable army, uh, probably about half stack from the, from the get-go. As you can see, though, a lot of your starting armies are just trashy militia. But there is the odd unit of goodness. Uh, of goodness, it's not real. And that also isn't a very good descriptive word. But you've got the Variag bowmen and swordsmen who are acting for you on that western edge. So a medium-sized starting domain with a relatively small army, it has to be said. So your leader capital um, and unique bodyguards and such. Well, of course, as I mentioned, Stilatsakand is your capital. Uh, and there is a, the UI, uh, the CSM image for the Kandish cities, which is very cool, created by the Elite Dwarf. Of course, heavily inspired by Mongolia and the Mongols in general. Um, but your leader is Khan Arkish. Uh, and that is the unique faction leader model. So that model is not unique to Khan Arkish. It is unique to anyone who holds the mantle of leader of Kand. A generic general looks like that gentleman there. And a generic captain, or just a captain, looks like that gentleman there. So there's clear distinction between the three. Your leader's the only one in actual real armour. Your general obviously has the stars and has uh, has armour. And the captain is just in his clothes. He's just jumped out of the bath. He's been told to lead an army. Your Khan has as his bodyguard the Variag Nobles, which are actually just the standard bodyguard for Khan. Um, because to have him have... Anything else would be incredibly OP. <laughs> Variag nobles on Yiltik there. If we ride north, yes. we do find a change for Warlord Rash, who has Wind Riders of Kand, the fastest unit in the game, as we'll cover when we get onto the unit side. But otherwise, Variag nobles again in, in Kizilkum and Variag nobles again in Chelkar and indeed on Togrul. So your only custom general is your faction heir, Warlord Rash. Your bodyguards, um, we've covered. Your diplomat comes out of Stalatsakand. Um, or, if I remember rightly, actually, no, indeed, uh, Kand <laughs> actually can't train a diplomat until you conquer someone's town. Um, so you get a diplomat to start with, basically. Um, you only ever really need one, just cheat him around the map. Um, so Tordan is your starting diplomat, uh, but you can't train a diplomat until you take the capital city of someone else. Um, you, you, your, your diplomats are trained far off. <laughs> Right, so Rebel Expansion, um, you've actually got quite a few options, but of course nothing to the north or the west. Mordor and Rune block you in there. Um, so your best bets are going to be to go south. You've got Krukmaher or Krukmaher uh, in the centre there. Uh, and to the south is Sayakan, uh, the larger region. And if you can weasel your way around, you might even be able to make it to Ankaragmir before um, anyone else beats you to it. Remember, this large, vast wasteland to the south is exactly that. It is wasteland. You cannot even actually get in here, which is something that amazes me all the time. We frequently get people asking the question, how do I conquer the land to the very far south? Uh, um, I, and I, I, my instant reaction is, have you tried to move a general into that land? Does the fact that your general can't move into that land not give you an indication that perhaps you can't get there? But anyway, no, it, it's, it fails to remind people. Um, you can actually just nip around the south side of this lake, though, so I'm lying a little bit. But um, it, there's an there's unpassable terrain that borders the entire region, so you can't go there. But um, anyway, in continuing with Rebel Expansion, of course, your best bet is to push into Harondor. There's four nice, juicy provinces to snap up here if you can beat Harad um, and Dol Amroth, really, to them. Uh, Esthala, Amun Aithel, Imlad Khanan, and Tyr Ethraid. 
I mean, if you can as well, you could beat Umbar, uh, sorry, forgive me, the Ar Ardenaim to Gobel Mirland, um, because the Ardenaim will have real trouble taking down Captain Mirazor. Um, and so you might be able to sneak in behind and take the independent city of Gobel Mirland. And indeed, then that gives you much of the northern side. But as I say, Dol Amroth will be rushing to beat you to it because they start in Tirithoros. So that brings us neatly on to your neighbours and diplomacy. Well, if we start with diplomacy, you're allied to Rhun, Mordor and Harad and you're at war with Gondor. So you're not yet at war with Dol Amroth and you're actually completely neutral with the Arden Naim. So obviously that is the funneling you. Your diplomacy is funneling you towards the Athir Anduin, the mouths of the Anduin and the, and the battleground here. Although you can try and as, again try to neat, uh, beat Mordor to the crossings of Osgiliath and try and take those. But as a predominantly cavalry heavy faction um, or in fact the game's other main cavalry faction you will not really have a nice time if you're defending cities you will find defending cities really quite challenging unless you really load up on infantry which aren't even that great your infantry are pretty subpar so taking Osgiliath might not be that great because Gondor might be able to take it back quite easily they outclass you on the field without any hooves quite nicely uh, of course, neighbours are those that we've already spoken of. Rune to the north uh, in the vast lands of Mataram and then up to their capital of Mistrand. Uh, Mordor in Seragost and then beyond to Baradur itself and of course Harad. Now Harad will try and mop up these rebel territories as well and it's very likely they'll go for Ran Karagmir. But sometimes they do meander about and you might be able to beat them around. It's yet to be seen. So, economy and buildings. Well, Cand actually, although it doesn't look it, they share the same traits as the Wild Men factions. And what I mean by that is that you cannot upgrade a castle beyond the castle level, which is the second tier. You can only go to castles. So, if we go to the building browser, you get the keep, everyone gets the keep, that's the starting level. You can only upgrade it once to a castle. And in terms of cities, you can only go to a large town. You can't get a city or a large city, so you're restricted there as well at the moment. We'll talk more about that in a, in a minute, but that therefore, of course, impacts your economy. You're not going to earn the best money and because you don't have the same amount of buildings that everyone else has. Um, so you do have to be careful of that. Now, in terms of training troops, I said that they are like um, the wild men factions and they are like the wild men factions in every aspect. So you're... Your recruitment center, the nomadic gathering grounds, trains Candish raiders and, and nomad horsemen. But the military lodgings, the second tier, trains a vast number of troops. And you don't have archery range barracks stables. You just have a single building chain that trains everything. Of course, like everyone else, your militia come out of your meeting hall. So there's um, you'll get those three units wherever you build the meeting hall. But after that, it's all in one building chain. The barracks. Um, and, and it goes up there. To, um, through the ranks. So there's the Nomadic Gathering Grounds, the Military Lodgings, then the Nomadic Confederation Camp, which brings in even more troops, and finally the Hall of the Brotherhood, which gives, as you can see, quite an experience bonus for troops and whatnot as well, where you get your very best units. So the training for CAND, training um, or, or recruitment for CAND, I should say, is uh, more streamlined than it used to be in 0.5 um, whereas there's no longer the vast number of um, guilds. So previously you could get one of the four warlords units from one of four unique buildings and you could only have one building per town so you'd only ever get one of your elites in each individual town. But we did away with that system um, and instead there's the uh, CSM Port Webamari and instead we went with a single chain and except there's a fourth tier of the building which gives the various elites that um, Cand can train. So there's the, um, that's where your bests come from. You still get the guild, you get a Warlord's Brotherhood, Nomad's Guild, and Warlord's Brotherhood giving you all of those effects. You still get a Horse Breeder's Guild, um, and there they are showing there. Um, and of course, like all of the other nations as well, if you wish to train a garrison, you will need to build the Armory building, and then you can upgrade the Armory building. Um, to the Militia Armoury, which will give you even more of a garrison force in that location. But it does cost money, um, a minus 80 from the Armoury, a minus 220 from the Militia Armoury. So you do have to watch out for that. There's the Dramatic Gathering Grounds. Varia Glances, Warlord's Guard, Warlord's Cataphract Archers, Warlord's Cataphracts. 
looking very swanky. I think that's all for the buildings. I was trying to think. Yeah, no, we'll touch on the buildings again in just a moment when we come to the scripts, the scripts side of things. Oh, I should say that I do believe actually that the Hall of the Brotherhood. No, don't worry. Ignore me. Ignore me. Ignore me. Right. Um, oh, your blacksmith only goes to tier three. I knew there was another one. Um, your blacksmith only goes to tier three. Um, the blacksmith. It gives you splint mail is the name for Can's mail. So partial leather, full leather and splint mail. Um, because those names can be unique for every faction. So that's what we've done. Right. So on to the scripts then. Of course, the Candish script is, of course, the blue wizard script. Let me just clear up some um, um, miss some wrong information about this, if, if you will. First of all, the blue wizards only affect Cand. Even though I didn't mention them in the rune video, some people commented and suggested that I'd missed the blue wizards off. Thankfully, some other people commented and said no, they're only for Cand, and that's correct. The blue wizard script only affects Cand. And that is what we are to talk about now. So, the blue wizards are a simple choice. They will come to you, there'll be various message chains, they'll come to you toward the later stages of the game. It's around turn 90 if memory serves. Um, it could be earlier, it could be later, but essentially it's toward the end of the game. I don't want to give you absolutely every single aspect, but obviously I'm cover it as best I can, but I try and leave some surprises. And you'll be approached by a messenger of the Blue Wizards saying thus. Essentially, the Blue Wizards are heading towards Cand with a large army. They have gathered forces in the east to counter Sauron. So point one, we've opted for the Blue Wizards to have succeeded in their mission, and they are actually returning to Middle-earth with the forces they have gathered to counter Sauron, as was the mission of all Istari at the, um, when they came to Middle-earth in the thousandth year of the Third Age. So, the Blue Wizards are coming and they've got a large army. It also lets you know that they've actually managed to suppress various clans in the East already. And the question is, do you join the Wizards or will you stand with Sauron and fight against them? That, at its core, is the basic concept. But there's a lot to it. So, when the wizards actually arrive, you get your choice. Or, before the wizards arrive, you get your choice. Do you side with Sauron, or do you side with the wizards? Well, let's start with the wizards first, actually. If you side with the wizards, then the five key towns that you currently see held by the AI at the moment will all revolt against you. Or rather, they'll be attacked by large rebel armies. Um, so you do have a chance, actually, of holding them off. Now, this is to simulate that a large chunk of your population will not want to stand against Sauron. They will want to stay with him. So to reflect that, a large part chunk of your population rises up against you and fights you. So first of all, you've got to put down mass rebellion. Now, it's very, very common for you to lose all... Um, at least, well, or some, if not all, of your provinces to these rebellions. They are large armies. Very much our goal was that you lose your starting regions. It's a really difficult campaign. Do let me just stress that from the outset. Choosing the good side, joining the Blue Wizards, is a really challenging campaign. Um, so anyway, you'll get attacked by these large armies, and the largest army which will attack your capital will be led by Ancanta. Um, and he is an inquisitor of Sauron and he comes with a beastly army. It is incredibly difficult to win. So the keen-eyed amongst you who know you're going to join the Blue Wizards, it might be prudent to abandon your towns before they come. But that, where's the fun in that? Stand, try and fight. After a few number of turns then, the Blue Wizards will actually arrive and there will be two armies led by each, wid each wizard, Palando and Alatar. And they will have with them the Dwarves of the Orokani Hills. The Dwarves side with you. Choosing the Blue Wizards at its basic core is essentially choosing infantry. And choosing Mordor is akin to choosing cavalry, basically. So you side with the Blue Wizards, they'll arrive, two armies, one headed by each wizard with a large contingent of dwarves, another unit which I'll cover in just a moment, the Suryut Chariots, or no, they're not called that, are they? They're called the something else, Ushishia. The Ushishia Chariots... And just two large armies. But not only that, you are then obviously set automatically at war with Harad, Mordor and Rune. And you are then set neutral to your old enemies, Gondor and Dol Amroth. So, kind of the point of siding with the good forces is that you lose your heartlands, yes. But then you, as a horde nation, as it were, 
Although you're not strictly a horde nation, but you, you then then the horde that is canned moves off to the west to join the nations you've now sided with under the head of the blue wizards, and you use your large armies you've just gained to strike at the heart of Mordor. So it may even be easier to just come in from the west and take Baradur. Not only this, siding with the blue wizards will then give you, you saw it in the building hall, uh, in the castle one, access to the Orokani clan halls in certain locations, which gives you the Orokani units just in full. Now, they're very rare. They train really sporadically, but it gives you just some much needed late game elite forces that walk on foot. <laughs> Additionally, if you side with the Blue Wizards, your culture changes from the Dark Shrines, which give you which what you currently are, which is Men of the East. Um, and it changes from Men of the East, and it switches to Nomadic, which is the lesser one there with the Sun Star. Um, and unfortunately, apologies for the... Um, I've not found a suitable UI yet, so the Nomadic Temples are just the Medieval 2 ones. Uh, but So you, you get new... Um, culture spreading locations or culture spreading buildings and in addition to that as well if you side with the blue wizards your um <laughs> your mining ability gets a boost and you then get the almost as good if not as good as the dwarves mining bonus so if you side with the dwarves they bring also their knowledge of mines and you get the ability to get much more money out of your mines so as a pure list, you get Orokani Dwarves, you get the Ushishia Stormrider Chariots, which we'll see in a moment. You get the two Blue Wizards themselves, who are just very good generals. You get much better mining facilities and possibly even blacksmith improvements, but don't quote me on that one. Um, so that's the rundown, really. Heavy infantry, a solid cavalry unit or a, a chariot, two solid generals and a mining boost. That's kind of the 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 basic core but you also then shift allegiances completely and you are now good is the biggest thing that it does so if you don't side with the blue wizards you stay with sauron you remain loyal then the large army that attacks your capital at uh, um, ancanta he actually joins you so instead ancanta joins you rather than attacks you and you have to fight off the large blue wizard army that you get if you side with the blue wizards so the two blue wizard armies will arrive large headed up by these dwarven warriors ushishia chariots and they will attack you so it's quite the reverse rather than all of your towns being attacked your capital will be attacked with an overwhelmingly powerful army but you will have ancanta and not just Ancanta. He also brings with him... I don't know if they're listed. I didn't see them. Yes, the Inquisition buildings. There's the Inquisitor's Watch and the Inquisitor's Headquarters. Yeah, which interestingly looks um, exactly the same as your culture spreading building. But ignore that. Um, <laughs> it is the same. Yes, it is the same. So you get the Inquisitor's Watch and the Inquisitor's Headquarters. And as you can see, you get the three units that Mordor gives you are the Temple Wards, the Dark Numenorians, the Temple Marksmen, the Archer version, and Great Beasts. Um, so you get two very good um, ground units. Not arguably not as good as the dwarves, but very solid units, but you also get the great beasts. And not only that, siding with Sauron allows you to then upgrade your castles to the third tier, the stronghold tier. So, whereas on the Bree script, as we'll cover when we come to that, one siding with the mercenaries allows you to upgrade your towns a tier more. With Cand, if you side with Sauron, you can upgrade your castles a tier more. So it unlocks a whole new level of castles for you and gives you much more military focus. But that is about it. Siding with Sauron isn't as glamorous as siding with the Blue Wizards, but it is easier. You don't change any allegiances, of course. You get a big boost to your relations with Sauron. And you get the Dark Numenorians, you get the Great Beast, you get Ancanta, who's a very good general. And you get the um, Inquisition Building. But the Inquisition Building, um, if I, I believe, cannot actually be built everywhere. It is... I'm fairly certain that it can only be built in Stilatza Kand, whereas the Orokani clan halls can be built in a few locations. So the Inquisition units are far rarer than the dwarves. So there is that. But you do get that extra tier of castle. So blue wizards are dwarves, a chariot unit, the blue wizards themselves, and a mining bonus. And Sauron is the Inquisition units, or the Dark Numenorians from Mordor, the great beasts, a good general, and the ability to upgrade castles. Oh, and also if you side with Sauron, you can also build boats, which you cannot do with the Blue Wizards, because dwarves famously hate water, and they don't um, particularly relish the thought of sailing. And um, 
Whereas if you side with Sauron, even though orcs even more famously hate water, Sauron and the Inquisition, of course, do not. Dark Numenorians are famous seafarers, and they bring their knowledge and allow you to get boats. Which, uh, which the point of that is very much that if you can get down to the sea, you can then at least now sail off to new lands and not be stuck in the corner. Because now we come on to kind of tips and difficulty before I just cover the map changes. The problem with Canada, the reason we were so keen to make this script so varied and so different from anything else is because the basic canned campaign is easily one of the most dull. You start totally secure in the east and your nearest enemies are miles away. Your armies are outrageously good if you control them. Cavalry armies controlled by a human are really OP. You'll all probably know that by now playing Medieval 2. So the canned campaign is very simple. So we wanted to really jazz it up and we have done. And trust me when I say the good campaign as can, so siding with the blue wizards is so hard. Easily one of the hardest campaigns in the game now. So if you like a challenge, go for it. But staying with Sauron, of course, leaves you in the corner, so you've got to find new enemies. Now, if you actually attack Mordor, Ruin, or Harad early, the game automatically assumes you're going to side with the blue wizards, and the script can kick in a little earlier. Um, or at least, certainly, the decision is already made for you by the time the wizards arrive. So that's just a nice little neat feature. So if you've already decided that you're going to attack Mordor, which is actually one of the easiest ways to play as canned, then by the time the wizards arrive, you will um, they'll automatically side with you because you've already sided with them even without knowing it. So do note that. So then, map changes in this area. Um, there have been a few, of course. Certainly from 0.52, Harad has hugely changed. Starting with Sayakan. Sayakan did not used to exist. As many of you will remember, Ankaragmir used to be one of the largest provinces in the game. In fact, Ankaragmir used to be the entire southern province. All of this, which is now wasteland, used to be Ankaragmir. So Ankaragmir is now hugely re reduced in size. And it's now got a nice little lake um, and some rivers running through the desert. Also, the desert actually now features. Previously, this was all grassland. Um... But at the request of some users, I thought, yeah, you know what, screw it, we will chuck desert in. So the desert is now actually a thing. Corondage is now a different size to accommodate Sayakan. There was a region here, Kruk Boyadler, I believe, if naming... I can't remember the names, they all kind of blend into one. I'm pretty sure it was called Kruk Boyadler, and that was there, but that's gone, that moved somewhere else. Um, of course, the river, the Harnan River, is now sailable. It was not before, um, and there are crossing points here in Gobil Mirland and just north of Finabel, the capital of Harad. Estala is also a new province. Um, I mean, Ithel was changed up. This used to just be two large provinces, and it's now four provinces. So there's a lot different in the Harad arena. Um, the geographical Harad, not the faction. So map is fairly different to having played 0.52. Kand is easily the most changed faction between 0. or version 1, or whatever the last version of the game was called, to version 2.1 or 2.2. Um, which you most likely will be playing soon enough. So, Canned is a hugely different campaign, and I implore you all to have a go with it. But that concludes the campaign side of the changes. I'm sure I've got some bits and pieces wrong, but that's part of the charm, really. I do actively like to... I don't like to get things wrong, per se, but I'm not bothered, because I do like you to find some things out for yourselves. I, I, I was really reticent to even cover the script in that much detail, because I want you to be surprised when your towns rise up against you. But if I don't tell you that, you'll all moan, and people will think it's a bug, because uh, people just think everything's a bug. So I did have to spell it out. Anywho, I'll now go over to the battle map side and I'll show you all the units that you get over there. Welcome then to the battle map side. So looking at Canned as an overview, obviously your eye is immediately drawn to the sheer number of cavalry choices that they have. Um, which is very indicative of the faction as a whole. And of course, but then after that actually, the eye is rather drawn to the fact that they don't really lack anything. They're not particularly shy of archers, nor are they shy of infantry. But as we go through the stats, you'll realise that whilst they've got these choices, they're really not going to be winning awards in any of those categories. Um, and there's their general right at the back there. So, they've... So kind of classic setup with everyone else. They've got a militia tier. Um, there's three units within that. Then they've got their kind of um, pre-barracks event normal or, or mainstream tier, if you will. 
Um, and then you've got your post barracks event units, and then you've got your elites, and they've got one uber unit. So if you're unfamiliar with my <laughs> my scaling, um, you've always got your kind of your militia, and then your mainstream units, then your post barracks event mainstream, then your elites, and then any ubers that you've got, and then the general is always in his own category just to show him off. Now the first thing to do, let me cover. I was saying in the last part of the video about how you train the Brotherhood units, and uh, that was erroneous. Um, the Brotherhood units have actually been renamed, and they're now the Warlords Cataphract, Warlords Cataphract Archers, and Warlords Guard. The Brotherhood live on in your general only, so the famous black armour from the older version is now only worn by your general, which, to be honest, is good, because with the overhaul that Khan's roster has had, the black armour of your elites was actually easily your worst armour in terms of design, um, or they now look really, really good. So let's just get straight into it then with a the very Mongolian themed militia that you've got. The Step Tribesmen. Uh, Step Tribesmen, skill against mounts because they throw javelins. Their melee is only two. Missile is six, which isn't bad. Um, it's nice to have a javelin troop as your militia because it gives them a purpose. Outside of that, they're pretty pitiful. Five total defense, although that's fairly evenly spread. So no great weakness other than the fact that they're just weak full stop. And their melee, as I say, is at two. Um, their morale is poor, their morale response is poor. They are warriors, but they're not elite, they're not battle-hardened, they're not a, a particularly aggressive, they're just people fighting because a powerful overlord is telling them to. <laughs> um, accuracy is only average, and they only get two javelins each. Um, however, if you lose half the unit, then they get four each, but obviously the numbers make that only two each, really. They are supported at this tier by a archer unit, uh, an archer unit, sorry, the step archers. Step archers, again, pretty poor. They're better than Snaga, the orc slave unit, but they're not really as good as uh, anything else. They're a kind of a very average human faction. Um, similar in the same sort of vein as Darwinian, Bree, possibly Ennard Wythe. As I said, they have a wild men. They're based on the wild men in the files um, in terms of the way that they train units, their building restrictions, and they're actually quite similar in terms of stats, I would suggest as well. So only a two melee, two missile, four defense. But the, their stats here with the step archers means that when they're f when they've finished firing their arrows, they're actually about as good in melee as your tribesmen. So both of you don't need to worry about them getting caught up into melee. Both of them are going to die almost immediately. But at least you know that your archers aren't going to die any quicker than your tribesmen. But do note the tribesmen at least have a bonus against cavalry, so they can at least try and survive a bit longer. Although you're the chief cavalry nation in these parts, so you're not too worried about other enemies' cavalry. But the militia cavalry you get are the marauders. Very much just people who are basically, I don't know, they've taken some sort of substance. They're absolutely smacked off their faces and they think raiding towns is going to be the way forward. Those are the marauders. Um, they're actually pretty damn rubbish, despite the fact that they look quite aggressive, like berserkers on horses. They're actually really naff. Their attack is only three. They've got a really poor charge bonus of four. They don't have a lance, which means they don't really get an uh, extra oomph from the charge. They've only got the axe. Their total defense is five, which again is garbage for a horse unit. Horses, if just to briefly touch on it because this is the first real horse faction... The reason that cavalry dies so easily in Medieval 2 comes down to a simple question of hitboxes. Horses, unfortunately, have a hitbox that's about three times the size of a human, of a, of a standard infantry, which means they can be hit a much larger number of times, and it means they are easily killed. This is the same reason why Mumakil can be killed quite simply with javelin troops, because every single javelin hits, which means the unit takes a huge hit to its hit points and almost dies on the spot. Cavalry are very much the same. This is why it's quite easy to kill cavalry in prolonged melee because they can just be hit from so many different angles, which is true of real life, really. So it's one of those rare times where um, a, a game actually sort of accurately reflects it, at least in that regard. I mean, their cavalry punch way too deep into the enemy line, but we won't worry about that. Now, you will have noticed that they're skilled against mounts, which is a, a trait very, very, um, that runs through the Candice roster as we go through. You're kind of an anti-cavalry cavalry nation. So whereas Rohan don't really have loads of units that are skilled against mounts, they just a skilled mount faction. If Kand and Rohan met on the field... Ah, sorry, Windows is telling me I've got no threats. If Kand and Rohan met on the field, Kand would almost certainly beat them because they've got a lot more effective against cavalry cavalry. <laughs> but do note their low morale and poor morale response. Bonus against horses, not beasts. Do note that. It's only against horses. That also does not count wargs. Wargs are actually camels, so it's only other horses. 
But that's your militia tier. So then we jump up to your main tier, which are now the nomad units. There's a clear naming theme. Step units are your militia. Nomads are your mains. Um, Candish or Variag, sorry, apologies. Variag are your um, post-game main, and then Warlord are your elites. Um, so with the Nomad units, you get far more ground options. And this is where the unit designs really start to come into their own. A real mix of just Eastern Asian cultures all bashed into one, which is really cool. Obviously, they've got the infantry flags, which are very indicative of Japanese medieval warfare or feudal warfare, if you will. Um, and But then they've got a more of a Mongolian kind of Western or Northern Chinese military design in, in their actual units. So it's quite a nice mishmash of just, as I say, Eastern cultural themes. And then you could say that the shields are actually getting more into sort of the um, Western Asian theme, uh, more the kind of Arabian Peninsula and, and that kind of area. Um, so it's a nice, nice bashing together of cultures to make a fantasy culture that can't be said to be a, a like one particular culture. Anyway, that out of the way, they come in two forms in the melee. There's a standard sword and board, which is exactly as it says on the tin. They've got a six attack, which is all right. Defense of ten, not bad. Again, those are the same sorts of stats as Gondor Militia. That gives you an idea of how outclassed you will be on the field. Your mainline unit is only as good as the militia of your most likely first enemy. So do watch out for that. Average morale, average morale response. They don't like snow, but um, you actually get a bonus in desert, which only really comes into play if you fight against Harad. But um, <laughs> if you do decide to backstab Harad, it, you both like deserts, so at least you'll both like fighting each other. Uh, and then we come on to the Nomad Axemen, your first real shock infantry. They get a bonus against armor, which is always very nice. Reliable in deserts, very rare, as I say. Five attack, four charge bonus. They're not actually that great, really. The shock troops of Ennard Wyth are even that good. So, a bit risky. Uh, but still, a shock troop is a shock troop. And if you use them as intended on the flanks, or certainly in the rear if you can do it, no pun intended, um, no means no. But if you can, they are very, very effective. And effective against armour is very useful for a shock troop. It just boosts them up and gives them that extra le lethality. Your archers are the unit that Rune actually borrows from you if they side with you, and they are the Candish Hunters, which are just a sound archery unit, really. Five melee attacks, pretty good. Nine defense, so your same sort of stats as the Nomads, um, but with the bonus that you shoot arrows first. So they're just a solid archer unit, they really are. Um... I mean, they're not amazing, but for the uh, how early you can get them in the game, they are they are pretty damn good. So you can rely on your Candish Hunters. And supporting you are the mounted variant of the same, which are the Candish Raiders. Or Riders? No, Raiders. They're just mounted cavalry. Mounted cavalry is really, really powerful. And something that you might have noticed as you look um, through the stats, Cand actually has a lot of archer cavalry. Um, so you don't get any in the militia tier, but you've got one in your main, you've got one in your post-elite, um, in the post-barracks event elites. You've got one in your actual elites, your uber elite shoots arrows, and your bodyguard is a mounted cavalry archer. So cavalry archer is very much the theme of Cand. That's the, if, if you just sum every nation up by a single unit, Cans would be cavalry archers. Um, and that's uh, what the Candish Raiders provide at the beginning. Cavalry archers are useful, of course, because you can easily run away. The reason cavalry archers are so OP is purely because they are almost guaranteed to get all of their arrows off, whereas ground infantry, ground archers sometimes don't because they get attacked in melee. They get a bonus against other horses as well, you'll note there. Um, so skilled against mounts, as I say. So a second of your cavalry units already that is skilled against other cavalry gives you a nice little boost. And then we come on to the Nomad Horsemen. Light cavalry. These are actual, actual cavalry, if you will. Sorry, they are good at charging the enemy, whereas marauders really aren't. Marauders are so subpar. You're, they look cool and they look really aggressive, but they're really awful. But the nomads will actually do the job. Ten defense, seven charge bonus, four attack. They've actually got a lance or a spear in this case, I'd say. And again, skilled against mounts. The third of three cavalry units so far that all get a bonus against other cavalry. You really are very good at taking down other cavalry. Do note as well that their secondary attack is, is better than their main, their initial charge attack. So once they're in melee with other cavalry, they'll at least be keeping up with them as well. They're just a really good unit. Candish, and the nomad units are, are solid for Cand. They really are. But then the barracks event hits and we come on to the only ground unit you get um, in the post barracks event units before you get to your elites. And those are the Variag Swordmen. Um, so Variag Swordmen are a cross between shock troops and mainline. 
And the reason I say that is because they have the two-handed sword animation, not the two-handed axe animation, which is not as good on the shock infantry front. Their charge bonus is only six. But their attack is 11 and their defense is 14. But they don't get that bonus against armor. And that's kind of what drops them down from the shock tier to the normal tier, if you will. They don't get that bonus against armor. Um, their stamina is good, though. Morale is good. Their morale response is impetuous, which means they might charge without orders. But they also can deal with morale shocks quite nicely. Again, they don't like snow, which is basically the theme of all of your warriors. So your whole army is slightly worse in the winter. That's basically what that means. But their defense is 14, but do note that they have no shield. So they are particularly susceptible to arrow fire. Any unit with no shield is very susceptible to archer fire. And then we come to the final archer that you get, and rounding out the fact that Kandar are by no means a ground, a ground archer nation. The Variag Bowmen are your last archer unit. And they are just slightly worse than the, than the ranger units. So the missile attack is only five, um, and that's your, your best. I mean, the, the elves' best missile attack, I think, is, is nine for their standard non-niche units. It's something like 12 for their proper elite Noldorine bowmen, or whatever they're called. Um, so you're really, obviously, you're way lower than the elves, but everyone's lower than the elves. But um, even nations like Dorwinian, if they choose the humans, are going to be better at arrow archery than you. Dol Amroth, um, although Dol Amroth and Gondor are only going to be better because they get rangers. Same with the Ardenaim if you backstab them. So you're not, a you're not an archery nation, but your archers are at least good enough. Varag Bowmen are going to keep the enemy on their toes. Um, a 7 melee attack and a 13 defense means as well that they're actually going to survive if the enemy does arrive at them, which is very likely. Um, so they're actually a solid unit. As I say, you're not the best archery nation, but your best archer is quite good. And it's not going to let you down, like some nations. Um, but then we come to the cavalry at this tier then, and again, you're supported by the Variag unit. So another horse archer. Not much more to say about them other than they're better than the other horse archers that you've got. Again, they are skilled against mounts. So <laughs> we've now got every cavalry unit I've shown so far gets a bonus against mounts. Defense of 14, melee attack of 7, missile of 5, charge of 5. They're good cavalry again. Now do note that when you are charging the enemy, it's best to come out of this loose formation because it doesn't actually work very well. You want to try and get them in line formation if you can. So the be one of your better post barracks event units are the Variag Lancers who uh, borrow the Iwotheodar horse, but retooled and recolored to suit Kand, but it fits perfectly, I think, and it looks really good. And they've got nice little frilly feathers on their lances, just to separate them from everyone else. Um, and they're just really solid. Uh, 11 charge bonus. Skilled against mounts again. Solid charge. They've got a lance. 18 total defense. These people don't mess around. This is where the fact that you're a cavalry nation starts to come onto the fore, uh, which means come to the foreground or bring attention to itself. These units will punch deep into enemy lines and they will murder anything that is of a tier lower than them. So if you're coming up against enemy militia, the Variag Lancers are going to really punch home. So a solid unit. And then the unique unit of Kand is unique in that it's just its only real thing is that it's lightning fast are the Wind Riders. Light Cavalry! Light Cavalry! <laughs> For some reason, they're Japanese. Or my terrible imitation of a Japanese um, game narrator. Anyway, the Wind Riders. Um, their attack is actually really solid. They are the closest thing you've got to a melee cavalry unit. Um, but the reason that that is really is because they are there for one purpose, and that is to run down anyone that flees. They are lightning fast, as we shall see. Um, absolutely ridiculously fast. In fact, when we set the armies up, we'll do a little race, and um, you'll just see how much these guys leave everyone else in the dirt. Uh, but they've got an 11 attack, a charge of 5, and a 15 total defense. They are pretty damned good. Um, their morale response again, though, the Kanda not a nation of high morale, so only good, and their morale response is only impetuous, or it, which is actually the best, sorry, but their morale is only good. So none of your units are really going to win awards in terms of, I say that too much, but none of them are really going to stand on the field as long as elite Gondorians, Dol Amrothians, Ardenaim, even the elite Haradrim will probably give you a run. Um, of course, the, basically everyone else other than the wild men will route before you, uh, or route after you, so... You, You've got to really play it clever with who you fight and where you fight. But then we come to your elites, the three warlords. They used to be four, but they've been reduced to two, uh, to three, with two of the ground ones merged into the one. So there's the warlords guard. And so they used to be a sword and an axe version, but we did away with one of them and just made them a two-handed heavy axe wielder. Which is a nod to the fact that I think the only line that actually describes Kand in the books is that they are axe-wielding warriors from Kand. So their elite unit wields an axe. 
They get a 9 attack with a 7 charge and a 21 defense, but again, no shield, so quite susceptible to arrow fire, and they'll get murdered by crossbows because most of their defense is in armor. And crossbows laugh at armor. They inspire anyone that they're fighting near. They're effective against armor, as I've already mentioned. They have a very good morale, so at least they try. <laughs> Um, they will fight on, but maybe not as well as others, uh, other elites, but certainly better than anyone else in your army. I like as well that whoever's whoever changed them to silver, uh, probably Hummingbird, actually changed the song that I originally wrote. That One of the first unit descriptions I ever wrote for the mod way back five years ago when I was a lowly writer. I wrote the description of the Candice units and it's pleasing to me that someone has just changed it from as a black tide we rise to as a silver tide we rise in the name of Can. I like that a lot. Um, so thank you very much for that. That gives me great pleasure. So they're a really good shock troop, but they're not going to hold the line all that well. Um, and they'll die to armor piercing quite quickly. Um, so again, just an elite shock trooper. So you're, you're, when you get to the later stages of the game, you're still going to be using the nomad units to hold your line because your two late game infantry are both more aggressive than they are defensive. Um, and of course you've got cavalry to do the flanking really, so these units kind of occupy a redundant space which is on purpose. It means you've got to go looking elsewhere, hint hint nudge nudge, for your infantry. Either the dwarves or the dark Numenorians. And then there's the two warlord units in the late game. You've got warlords cataphracts. Heavy cavalry! They're skilled against mounts. Again, they frighten nearby enemy infantry and they charge without orders. 11 attack, 12 charge bonus, 23 total defense. Uh, very good morale, impetuous morale response. Bonus against every mount this time. They're actually effective against anything that is a mount. So any beasts, any elephants, any horses, camels, wags, the lot. Sauron, the Balrog, Ents, they're good against them all. So they get that nice bonus. They're up there as one of the best cavalry units in the game. But they aren't as good as, say, the Lok Na uh, Inisrim or um, the Royal Arthurdine Guard or the um, Swan Knights of Dol Amroth, because Dol Amroth and Rune are kind of the nations that have that really elite cavalry. Dol Amroth more than anyone else. Dol Amroth are an elite cavalry nation. So in terms of elites, you're not going to be as good as Dol Amroth, but as a cavalry nation overall, you are much better than nations like Dol Amroth, as we'll see when we come to Dol Amroth's overview. And you also get another cavalry archer. The difference being with this one is that when they get into melee, they are damned effective. Skilled against armor as well. Now that is not with their bows though, that is with their um, melee weapons, do note. It is not their archery that's effective against armor, their weapons, their melee only. Um, it might be their armor. I might actually be lying because it only normally displays that for the primary weapon, so I could be wrong. Yeah, I apologise. Either way, use them against our, um, armor. <laughs> so it's two. Their late game units are really, really good, but obviously cavalry is really where it's at. And the silver theme is very much Can's elite theme, which works so nicely. This unit looks really good for um, the, obviously for the medieval two engine. I mean, when you zoom in, it obviously it shows its flaws. But it's the same with any game that is 13 years old now, however old this is. But anyway then, the other unit that you get, now you only get these if you side with the blue wizards, but they are totally unique to Can. So the Orokani units I showed in the Erebor video, and the um, Inquisition units I'll show in the Mordor video, So and I didn't have room to fit them in here anyway. But these units can only be trained by Can, and they are the Ushishia Storm Riders. Ride. Now they are women, and they speak as women, but unfortunately not with the Eastern accent. So they stand out a bit, um, as you can tell. Ride! Ride. But they are crossbow women. <laughs> um, and, and then after that, of course, chariots are actually elephants. So they're not affected by stakes. They are particularly brought down by pikes. Um, anything with armor piercing will massacre them. Javelins will have an absolute field day because of how massive their hitbox is. Um, but they are really, really good. They inspire your troops. They have a special attack, which is the crossbow, which is a, um, a particularly effective crossbow. It also has to be said. They get a bonus against mounts again. They can't hide. And they do frighten nearby enemy infantry. Their melee attack is 14. Their missile attack is 14. Charge is 20. Their total defense is 16. They're beastly. Utterly beastly. They really are a really good elite unit. And they are a very nice addition if you side with the blue wizards. Um, and they're just cool. I think they're just cool. Um, I, they're, I, I really like them, to be honest. I'm not going to lie to you. And finally then, the last leftover, the only unit to su have survived from the original Candish design from version 1 or 0.52, whichever one it was, are the Nobles. 
Um, and it kind of is just one of those cases where it's a bit of a nod to the old team to say, we could change these, we could kind of adapt, obviously, the Warlord's unit to be the bodyguard, but then we're taking something away from how long our mod has been in development, how many members have worked on it, and it's nice to leave the odd little nod to people here and there, and for that, we happily leave the nobles looking the way they do. They're a very good cavalry archer unit, but they are quite small in number. But, I mean, they're solid. As you can see, effective against armor, um, inspire nearby troops, skilled against mounts. They have excellent stamina, very good morale, good morale response, high accuracy, 140 range, 36 missiles, 22 defense, and a melee of 9. They are really good units, but they are um, obviously only your generals, so you're not going to get them all the time. Right, now what we are going to do is just have a race because um, it's the only way to show that the Wind Riders are actually any good. Um, and we're going to line up every single cavalry unit um, and then we're going to play it and then we're going to pause it and we're just going to have them run to the other side of the map. Now there will of course be, this won't be the best test because they're not all starting on the same point. There will be slight delays in the game registering when I've told them to move, for example. Um, so it's, it's not going to work all that well, but it will at least work. The Marauders are also very fast, by the way. Um, let's put those near the Wind Riders so that they get that extra. And then there's your Noble rounding it out. Um, look how many cavalry units there are. More than half your army are cavalry units. That's mad. Utterly mad. Right, group all those up. Is it F6 I want? Yes, it is. Give them over to the AI. Um, and of course, we will play the um, Guess Who Is Coming Next game. But first of all, choose your general. <laughs> no, we need to start first. Uh, right, so they're going to go off. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to have them all run to the other side of the map. So if we just come over to the other side of the map and get a quick glimpse of the um, AI over there. And they should be in order, I think. Let's just double check. Ah, no, they're not. Bugger. All right, we just have to go along. So you are running to there. You're running to there. Windriders to there. You guys. Oh, you're way up in the corner. You're running there. You're running there. You're running there. You're to there. We've even got the Ushisha. Let's ensure they don't run into anyone because they'll kill them. Um, and the cavalry itself. There we are. Right. Unpause and away we go. There, As I say, they do take a brief moment to, for everyone to register that you've actually told them to do something. Um, but they all, they sort of all get underway. And there we are. They're off. So the cataphract units obviously holding up the rear because they do run very slowly. So all three Warlords units and the Variag Lancers, or the two Warlords units and Variag Lancers in last place. You've got the Variag Horse Archers really making ground up out there. They're really going for it. Uh, the Ushishi are not particularly fast. Of course, they are only elephants. And these three are all getting in each other's way and it's slowing down the Wind Riders. Oh, no, the Wind Riders are over there. The Wind Riders are keeping pace. They may have been slowed down then. I was expecting to see them really blissen. The <laughs> oh, I think our general's just died. Turn the wind of battle. Oh, the God, look how slow he is. Christ. The general is incredibly slow. He's also gotten tied up. He's out of the race. He is well out of the race. But the Wind Riders are not the fastest. That's amazing. They should be. I wonder then if it caps out with the mood, move speed mod and it gets to a certain point and it just doesn't go faster. But they're keeping pace with all of these. These are all the same speed. Um, but look how slow the cataphracts are in comparison. They are being left in the dirt. That is a huge gap over the cataphract style units. The ca they're ch they're, I'm surprised that the um, storm riders are faster than the cataphracts. Because they're elephants. I mean, it looks like chariots, but they're actually elephants running there. Um. Oh, and I've given away who is next by just looking over those. Their own archers... The Northern Dunedain's Variag Horse Archers are attacking us. <laughs> and of course it was the Northern Dunedain. I gave you very little glimpses. Now the reason we're actually fighting against random units here, because uh, there's some Rohirric units in there, there's Dol Amroth fighting on the field, is of course it's showing off the major pull of the Northern Dunedain. Their um, beacon of hope system. The Ardenaim are even fighting for the Dunedain. And there he is with the Dunedain banner of all things. <laughs> There's their uh, catapults and baluster crew at the back there. As Isengard have brought their banner, unfortunately. Not every unit. Um, that would be on a version 3 to-do list, I think, because it's really... Uh, it's quite a dull thing. As their pikes marching forward. There's some more Losarnak Axemen busting through. Gondor Spearmen with the Northern Dunedain banner, which looks very cool. There are the Arthurdine Royal Guard, one of the best cavalry units in the game. 
solid wielders. Look at the winged helmets they have, looking very cool. Um, Dunedain blustering through there. I'm really disappointed. I'm sorry, everyone. I was expecting the Windriders to smash that. They have the highest move speed mod of any unit. How they did not come top, I do not know. I don't know what made them so much slower than all the people around them. They are just as fast as the Marauders. I mean, there's just hardly anything in it. Anyway, that will do for Can. So I hope this overview has sh maybe shown you something you didn't know before. This <laughs> Tirithai are nice. All the horses' tails fly up when they charge. Or we will taste ashes instead of victory. Do they stop doing that when they get into the enemy? Let's find out. Do they like lower down when they um, when they engage in melee? Oh yeah, they do a bit. Oh, that's cool. Then. I didn't know they did that. And there we go. Oh, the enemy generals died. Yay! Go us. Anywho, so that is Canned. I hope you enjoyed the overview. I hope you've learned something new. I hope the new changes to Canned look appealing to you. And I hope you are looking forward to getting to see the Northern Dunedain again. Um, and the vast number of units that they can train. Although they're not obviously all going to be present in the next episode. Um, I'm only going to show the Dunedain units. Um, but that is Canned. So thank you very much for watching. And until we speak again, dear friends, Navarre and Perimad Malunin, and farewell.